early church. They were struggling as they were trying to learn, and you had people that were uh, that were Gentiles, people that were Jews. They were different cultures, different backgrounds. Uh, you know, as we were talking a little this morning, you think about the different backgrounds and cultures. People act like having cultural background differences and, and uh, people struggling with that, like this is something new they've discovered in the 21st century. Uh, but they were having the same struggles back in the church at Rome. You had Jews and Gentiles that were there together. Paul was trying to write to them and, re- and have them reconcile so that they knew and understood exactly what God's Word was teaching. Uh, they, you know, that's, that's a tendency today among the, among the churches, uh, and I know I'm sure we're guilty of it ourselves in some ways, uh, of taking interpretation of the Scriptures and looking at things a certain way. But what I, my desire is for each of you, uh, and I hope your desire is, I want to know and understand what does God say? What does God's Word actually say? Uh, and what is it actually teaching? And as we've looked through this book of Romans, uh, we've talked about the fact there were Jews and Gentiles there. Uh, the Jews were had been raised up and trained up in the law of God. And so they knew the laws of God. Part of the problem with that, much like uh, what, I've, what I've expressed here, you know, if you think about the church backgrounds that people are raised up in, a lot of times the struggle they have in seeing anything new or anything different or actually understanding the truth of God's Word is all of that background they bring with them. And, the Jew, and, and from what it appears in reading through the book of Romans, the Jews were struggling with that. They'd been trained up in the law. They felt the law and the practice of the law was essential uh, for, uh, for salvation. And so they were bringing that uh, culture with them into the, the church here at Rome, and obviously they'd become a, a, a back and forth somewhat between these different uh, beliefs, uh, between the Gentiles and the Jews, and Paul's trying to write to them, and, and we spent a lot of time there, back over the last number of weeks talking about the fact that Paul had all c- had told them and uh, had, uh, preached to them and written to them there in the first chapter, second chapter, third chapter, <laughs> fourth chapter, fifth chapters of the book of Romans. And part of what he was telling them is we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's only one way that we can be reconciled to God, and that's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We're justified by his blood, not by our works. Uh, If it was by works, he even brought up Abraham in the uh, Romans chapter 4. He said if it was by works, then it would be God would owe uh, us a debt if it was by our works that was achieving something. And so Paul goes back and goes through all of this, convincing them of the fact, uh, trying to convince them of the fact that we're saved by God's grace and by his blood. And then uh, part of what they were accusing Paul of preaching and teaching was the fact that, well, if it's by his grace, then uh, if, uh, if grace covers sin, then the more sin you have, the more grace you get. And Paul was like, no, 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 uh, don't, don't continue in sin that grace may abound. We're to be walking away from those things and not let sin reign anymore in our mortal bodies. He gets over to the seventh chapter of this book of Romans, and I'm going to go back and read a portion of Scripture eventually from chapter 2 before we get into the 10th chapter of the book of Romans this morning. That's where we kind of left off at last week. Uh, But I'm going to read a portion of Scripture because Paul is continuously reminding these people here of the fact that there's, there's a work that God does in our hearts uh, that's above and beyond what the law does. Uh, the law is, a, as Paul says in another letter in the book of Galatians, Paul tells us over there in Galatians uh, that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law was supposed to teach God's people, the Jewish people, that they were sinners. When they looked into the law, what they were to see year after year after year is, I've fallen short. Uh, I, you know, No doubt I have to go up and make sacrifices at the temple because I'm a sinner that has fallen short of the glory of, of God. And so... Paul begins to teach them there, there excuse me, in the uh, seventh chapter of the book of, uh, of, the book of Romans, uh, he begins to teach them that the fact that Christ came and fulfilled the law. 
and that they no longer needed to be married to the law, but they could actually uh, now, uh, uh, because Christ had fulfilled the law, they were dead to the law in a sense, to be married to another, which was Jesus Christ. He presents that case to them there in the first chapter of the book of Romans, and, uh, seventh chapter of the book of Romans. And as, as he finishes that out, Paul then goes on and talks about the fact that knowing the law, Paul, Paul was a man who was trained up in the law, knew the law, raised up at the feet of Gamaliel, had been ra- trained and raised to be, no doubt, a rabbi and to be a, a teacher of the, of the things of the law. Yet Paul says, I also saw a new law in me that when I, that when I would do good, evil was always present with me. And Paul then relates in that last portion of the seventh chapter of Romans the struggle that a man like Paul was continuing to go through, even as a, an apostle, saying, when I would do good, Evil's always present with me. The things that I would do, I do not. The things that I would not, those I do. That's, that's human. That is the human struggle of a child of God, <clears throat> not just a person that's not born of the Spirit. That's the struggle of a person born of the Spirit of God as we walk through this life is that constant battle of the fact we have a sin nature that doesn't go away until, until the body's laid down in the grave. And that's what Paul talks about a little bit in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, talking about how we're saved by hope uh, and the fact that hope that is seen, uh, uh, what does a man yet hope for if he's already seen it? Uh, uh, and he says, we're waiting, this creature, this, uh, this creation of God, this body of ours and this spirit of ours is waiting together, struggling together, waiting for the adoption to wit the resurrection of the body. We're actually longing and hoping for, we're, as we're li- even as we're living through COVID virus today in this world, the actual thing that many of us are thinking about was, is, won't it be wonderful when this old body is laid aside, there's no more cancer and there's no more COVID and there's no more struggling with my keeping my mind and my thoughts straight. Uh, there's no more of that struggle anymore because the body's been laid down and it's been actually uh, looking forward to the day when it's resurrected again as a glorified body. Uh, and he says, in the meantime, we have the Spirit of God which intercedes for us and makes the groanings of our prayers understandable to God himself because the Spirit knows the infirmities of our heart. So he's teaching, he's leading them, building them all through this book of Romans and teaching them. Uh, and then he goes on and tells them about there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Who? Jews and Gentiles. Uh, why? Because whom God did foreknow, them he also did predestinate. And whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, uh, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? What? If God be for us, who can be against us? That is the whole Ec- that's that's the echo that's going on here, and we, man, I'm reading through this first eight chapters of the book of Romans, and I'm thinking, wow, glory to God, I'm I'm on the mountaintop, and then Paul gets over to the ninth chapter of the book of Romans, and he says, I'm in a constant sorrow because my brethren, according to the flesh, he said, I wish I could be a curse myself for my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who are Israelites, and he and he he caveat he, what I call caveats then Israelites, <laughs> who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption. So he's not just talking about any group of Israelites; he's talking about Israelites who have been born of the Spirit of God, chosen in Christ uh, before the foundation of the world. The adoption pertains to them, and what is the adoption? It's already been told to us to wit the resurrection of the body. Uh, so he's already told us what adoption is in chapter 8. He says, These Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory of the covenants. And then he goes on and says, Not as though the word, verse 6 of Romans 9, he says, It's not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they're not all Israel that are of Israel. He's already told us that in, in uh, uh, Romans chapter 2. Uh, he is not an Israelite. Uh, according to the flesh, according to circumcision, but according to the circumcision of the heart, heart, the spiritual circumcision that takes place in the new birth. That's who a Jew is. That's what he describes it. And so then he goes on and tells us that, hey, 
Abraham had two son, uh, Abraham had a son, a promised son. And I think this is important to echo as we're heading into chapter 10. See, a lot of times we're not careful. We read these books of the Bible and we get, we get the idea that Romans 8, Romans 9 don't have anything to do with Romans 10 or Romans 12. Oh no, Paul was writing a letter to these people. Uh, and as he was writing to these people, he made sure to tell them as, as he's echoing this point that they're not all Israel that are of Israel, who does he bring up? Abraham there in Romans chapter 9 and he says you know Abraham uh, uh, had a had a had uh, well he bring and makes this comment he says it's not as though they which are of the children of the flesh these are not the children of God but his children of the promise are counted for the seed so what what is he saying there well we could we could go to several things I, and I, I guess I even thought of a, a additional item since we were talking about this over the last couple of weeks uh, but we know that uh, Abraham a son, had a son by the name of Ishmael by his wife's handmaid. Uh, but you know that after Sarah died, Abraham also remarried uh, and married Keturah and had children by both her and by concubines and so forth during that time. And so Abraham had other children uh, besides just Isaac. But he says Isaac was the promised seed. Isaac was the one uh, that God had promised Abraham and Sarah to have as a child. And we've tried to echo several different times during the course of this, these messages that part of the significance of Isaac is the fact that Isaac was not born after the flesh because Abraham and Sarah were too old to have a child. God directly intervened to bring about this promised birth, okay? <clears throat> he says, you and I, in, in Galatians, he says, you and I, like Isaac, are children of promise. So who did God, who did God promise that you and I would be his children? Uh, he promised to himself. He coveted with himself before the foundation of the world that he would have children, uh, that these children would be his bride, uh, and he was going to have a bride for his son, uh, for Jesus Christ. Uh, and so uh, as he talks about this and goes through this, he, uh, he go, brings up the doctrine of election because then when he gets to Isaac, he said, Isaac and Rebekah uh, also had two sons, uh, twin boys, uh, Esau and Jacob. Uh, but he says, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And uh, it's not, we discussed and explored the fact, it's not because I, uh, Esau was such a good person, or Jacob was such a good person, or Esau was such a bad person. They were both pretty much scoundrels. God made a sovereign choice of love to elect Jacob to be his chosen, to be the one through which his chosen seed would come and to be part of his elect family. Uh, God, you know, that part of the thing that people will try to teach today is that God elected a nation or God elected a group of people. Well, what he, what he elected was individuals. And that's what's taught right here. He didn't just elect a nation. He, he elected individuals to be his children. And he brings that to about in our lives through the new birth, which again is a sovereign work of bringing about that promised life that God had promised himself uh, uh, that he would bring about. He brings it about through the moving of the Holy Spirit and the speaking of Jesus Christ by his word into our hearts. I was, I was doing some looking, and I know y'all say, well, is he ever going to get to the 10th chapter? Yeah, I'm going to get to the 10th chapter, y'all. Uh, y'all hang in there with me. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a portion of Scripture where it talks about uh, the, the Spirit of God is, and the uh, new birth is described in more than one way. And I was looking at some of that. Uh, I've been studying some, besides studying the book of Romans, I've been studying about the Holy Spirit uh, and looking at some things related. But when we look at the new birth, the new birth, we can read chapter 3 of the book of John and we can see how the Spirit moves like the wind and no man knows whence it cometh or where it goeth, but God that sends it. Uh, and it describes that uh, uh, as the Spirit moves upon us, that uh, so is everyone that's born of the Spirit of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us we are new creatures. In Christ Jesus. And so that word creatures there just simply means we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Well, there's only one creator. Uh, and that's God himself and Jesus Christ. Uh, in fact, all creation is ascribed in Colossians chapter 1 to being the work of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whose word went forth as the word went forth and created all things, okay? So when we think about this election process and this new birth process that takes place in our lives, 
Christ. We can get hung up on saying, well, look over there. It's the third chapter of the book of John. It's the Spirit of God that moves upon us. But you know what else happens? Uh, and I'm going to turn and make sure I read this. Uh, if we turn over to the fifth chapter of the book, same book of John, we would find there in, uh, in, this, uh, in this fifth chapter of the book of John some words that's, that are, go like this. And in the 24th verse of the fifth chapter of the book of John, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. I want to echo the. I want to echo this for you this morning, and, and you know sometimes it might seem like a peculiar little point to make, uh, because but this is going to be important as we get over into the tenth chapter of the book of Romans. That's the reason I'm doing all of this. Uh, he says, "He that I verily, verily I say unto you, he that heareth my word." Uh, he doesn't say, "Hear my word," spoken by someone else. He that hears his words, uh, his words spoken. And he goes on and echoes that in verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Uh, uh, what we're talking about is those who are dead uh, in their sins. Uh, uh, oftentimes, a lot of people say dead in trespasses and sins. Well, okay, but they're, they're, they're dead because of their sins. They're spiritually dead. They hear the voice of the Son of God. It's no different, to, uh, and it's no different than uh, that it was in the days when Jesus was here. And we could go and look at the uh, the message about Lazarus. Uh, he had been away from uh, Mary and Martha and their family uh, uh, for four days, uh, so that by Jewish custom, it'd be well known Lazarus was dead. <laughs> and they had wrapped his body in grave cloths, put him into a uh, to a cave, uh, and Jesus comes up uh, uh, to the scene. Uh, Mary and Martha are weeping and telling Jesus, "Jesus, if you had just been here, uh, our brother would be alive." Uh, and uh, he begins to begins to tell them, uh, uh, "Do you think?" Uh, uh, just because I wasn't here then, that I'm not capable of bringing him to life now. And it says, uh, Jesus bowed his head and said, Lazarus, come forth. And the tomb opened up and Lazarus' body came. And I'm going to say the term, it body, the Bible doesn't say this, but it, it had to be this way. Uh, his body came floating out of the tomb because he was wrapped from head to toe in grave cloths. So he didn't come just walking out. He came floating out of that. And Jesus' instruction to those that were there that day uh, looked at him and says, unwrap him and give him something to eat. Uh, I'll tell you, when you and I are raised from a death in sins to a life in Christ uh, and God's voice speaks into our heart and we see here the, the life giving voice of Jesus Christ and the spirit of God moves upon us what you and I need then is to be fed, my friends, uh, not to, not natural food, uh, but spiritual food. Uh, we need to understand what has happened to us. Can you imagine? Uh, uh, maybe in that day, uh, uh, you know, our like, I, you know, if our imagination is maybe scriptural, or uh, then it's not too bad to let our imaginations run just a little bit. Uh, uh, but can you imagine that day uh, when they were unwrapping Lazarus? Don't you imagine Lazarus says, "What happened to me?" What has happened? Uh, uh, I was uh, I was sick. Uh, I'm wrapped in these grave cloths. What am I doing here now? Uh, and they had the pleasure of telling him, uh, Jesus came to your tomb, uh, and he spoke in his voice. Uh, uh, he didn't even go inside the tomb. He was outside and just said, Lazarus, come forth, and you came forth. Uh, I'll tell you, our our hearts when we're when we're spoken to by the by the word of God speaking into our hearts and giving us life and light and the spirit of God comes and takes residence there, my friends. Our very inquiring hearts are gonna should be saying, "What happened to me?" I was, I want, don't you know, uh, uh, isn't is that kind of what we see with the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus when he was struck down by the light of God? He was going to Damascus to uh, round up Christians and bring them back to be uh, uh, before the courts there in Jerusalem. Uh, and a light struck him down and he was blinded on that road that day. Uh, uh, and, if, and Paul uh, calls forth and says, uh, what would thou have me do? Paul wanted to know immediately, what would you have me do, Lord? And the, and the Lord gave him instructions. You go up to Damascus. You go to a place where a man that I'll show you. There's a man there that's going to be expecting you, uh, and he's going to baptize you and tell you 
all about me. I'll tell you, that's, uh, that's the way God works. So uh, he tells us here about this election of these two uh, uh, young boys, uh, 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 about the election of uh, Jacob versus Esau uh, and how God chose him uh, uh, and, and goes on. As we get to the end of the ninth chapter uh, and where we left off at last week, uh, he says something like this, beginning with verse 27 of Roman, Romans 9. He says, Asaias also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Uh, I think, and we talked about this, y'all will remember this if you were here, if you maybe were listening in, you remember that? A remnant is a piece of, like, if you think about a cloth, a remnant is what's left over after you've made something, right? And uh, they'd have little remnant pieces. That's how, what they made quilts out of a lot of times, where they take the remnant pieces and put them together and make a, make a quilt. Uh, well, uh, he says, uh, although the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant shall be saved. What's he talking about? He's actually prepping us for something that he's going to tell us in the 11th chapter of this same book of Romans. Uh, uh, but not everyone is going to understand and hear the gospel and understand it and be obedient even to what they hear and understand. Uh, so uh, uh, only a remnant will be saved. Uh, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness uh, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath, or that's the Lord of hosts, had left us seed. We had been as Sodom and Gomorrah and like unto Gomorrah. And what shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith. I'll tell you, uh, just doing the works of the law and not seeing beyond the law, what's behind the law. I'll tell you, uh, it can be a meaning, a meaningless, hollow type of worship. Uh, well, I've done my I've done my law service today. Uh, I, I I followed after. Uh, uh, I, I got up and I praised God. I read my Bible this morning. I read through so many verses of it. Uh, I had my prayer. Uh, I haven't committed adultery today. Uh, you know what you're trying to do? You're trying to justify yourself before God before by what you've done. And it's not walking by faith. And part of what, what you're doing and what we do when we do that is we're saying, uh, look at me, what I've done. Uh, look at how good I am because I followed all these pretexts. I was at church on Sunday morning. Uh, uh, I followed after all these precepts and so forth and not recognized yet there's still sinful thoughts in my heart and mind. Paul's already echoed it in Romans chapter 7, that even when I would do good, evil's present with me. Acknowledge that what we, what we stand in need of is a faithfulness, uh, of heart and life that says, you know what? I serve God because he, I love God because he first loved me. And I'm going to serve him. I'm going to do the best I can. Uh, and I'm also going to uh, bend down upon my knees daily and say, thank you, Lord, and forgive me, Lord, because today I've probably failed you again in this way, this way, and this way. Uh, but he says, the Gentiles, they followed after, not after the righteous, uh, the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness. Now, I'm going to pause right here before I get to Romans 10, and I'm going to turn back to uh, Romans chapter 2, because after, uh, as Paul was beginning this letter, he made, he made this comment, and there, it's, it's one of those phrases that he sets off by parentheses, you know, as he's explaining something that he's talking about here in Romans chapter 2. He's, first of all, he says, he says this, uh, and I'm trying to make sure I get into the right place. Uh, he says, Verse 11 of the Romans chapter 2, there is no respect of persons with God. Now, what he's talking about, God has no more respect for the Jews than he does for the Gentiles. Uh, today, uh, that verse of Scripture, that's one of those that's repeated more than once. Uh, we could go to Acts chapter uh Acts chapter 10 or 11, I think it is, where Paul went down to Cornelius' house and Peter, after he had preached to this Gentile, this Roman soldier centurion, uh, and saw that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they responded to the gospel, P P uh, Peter's response to that was, I perceive that there is no respect of persons with God. God had just as much respect for this Gen Gentile Roman centurion soldier as he did for Peter, who was one of the apostles. Uh, and uh, Paul repeats that here in the... Uh, 
second chapter of the book of Romans, uh, talking about uh, uh, the Jews and the Gentiles and their struggle with serving God and their struggles of the, of the heart and mind and so forth. He says, Therefore there is no respect of persons of God, for as many as have sinned without the law shall perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Uh, we could go right back over, if you would, uh, uh, and, and I, that, that portion of Scripture makes me think of another portion of Scripture in the uh, fifth chapter of the book of Romans, uh, where Paul is uh, there talking about uh, our justification. And part of the comment he makes in this discussion about justification is this. Uh, he makes the comment uh, that, the, that the, there was no law until... Uh, the time of Moses, uh, which is 400 years or so after the flood. Yet he said, from Adam to Moses, men continued to die. Why? Because they were sinners. They were sinners that uh, they had inherited the sin uh, nature uh, from their father Adam. It had been passed on right down through the line. And even though there was no law given that says, Thou shalt not, thou shalt have no gods before me, and thou shalt not uh, do this, and thou shalt not do this, and thou shalt not have no graven images, and all, there were none of these laws that were given till 400 years after the flood. Okay, uh, or maybe that was maybe even further than that past the flood because I think uh, uh, Moses was 400 years after the flood, but they were down in Egypt for 400 years. We know that. Uh, so as we, as we gather together and look at all this, listen to what he says here. For as many as have sinned without the law shall perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Then he puts his parentheses and says this, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. What is it that actually causes us in our, and this does it again, we're justified by the shed blood of Jesus Christ as far as our sins are concerned. But as far as declaring ourselves to be recognized as being just before our fellow man, and maybe even in our own hearts and minds, it's not the hearers of the law uh, that are justified, uh, but the doers of the law. And the point he's making here, and we'll get into this, uh, is the fact the Gentiles were doing the law even though they didn't have the written Ten Commandments and they didn't have the laws of God. There were Gentiles out there who had had God's laws written in their hearts, written on their minds. They were living moral, good, just lives and being uh, honest and with integrity before men. Why? Because God had written it on their hearts. Uh, so he says, it's not the hearers of the law that are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. God had given them the law. And here's the big argument. Here's part of the discussion that I think is going on at the church at Rome there were those that were saying, you have to hear the preaching of God's word to have faith. And Paul's making the case throughout the Roman letter, no, faith doesn't just come by hearing. Uh, faith also comes by the written work of God in your hearts. That's how faith comes to you. And so we'll get to that. Y'all are probably ahead of me now in the verses there in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans. But you know uh, where it says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, if you don't understand the, art, the discussion that Paul's having here in this 10th chapter of the book of Romans, you're not going to understand what he's saying there. Because Paul, throughout this letter, is, is uh, you know, today people talk about having a straw man. Uh, they throw the straw man discussion out there and let everybody take shots at the straw man, you know. Well, Paul's having a straw man discussion here in this part of this ninth and 10th chapters of the book of Romans. He's not only talking about what he believes to be the truth of God's word, he's also raising what, the, uh, what his accusers and what those that are teaching false teachings there at church at Rome are teaching, and he's bringing that up. And you'll, and you'll catch this now that I've told you this. Uh, uh, you'll catch this now as you read the uh, 10th chapter of the book of Romans. Uh, Paul will st make a statement, and then he'll say this. You know, how many times have you, or maybe you like me, you've read the Word of God, you see something, but it kind of goes, bing, you know, over your heads. Uh, he says, uh, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. He goes on, he says, but I say unto you. But I say unto you. Now, so now that I've got your attention on that, you will notice this when you get down there to that. 
Paul raises the things that others are saying and then says, but I say. And so as we read that, if we don't understand that, we'll interpret that, uh, that even that phrase, uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We'll say, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says faith comes by hearing. Paul is presenting the argument of his accusers and then answering them. If you don't get that, <laughs> you, you miss it. <laughs> and that's the reason I'm going back to the second chapter of the book of Romans uh, because here in the uh, in the end of the ninth chapter, he says, the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. The Gentiles had attained a righteousness which came by faith. How did they have faith? They didn't have the law. God had written the faith into their hearts. That's how they had it. So here in this second chapter, going back to there, y'all just bear with me as I flip back and forth for a minute. He says, For the not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts." their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So Paul tells us here in this second chapter of Romans, uh, they, the Gentiles, the reason they could do the righteousness of the law was because they had the law written in their hearts. They didn't have the Ten Commandments. They didn't have the scrolls. Can you can you hear? Uh, can, he's made this argument in two. Can you can you hear now the discussion over in the, uh, in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans uh, where Paul says, "Well, then," uh, uh, and I'm trying to make sure. I, uh, he says, uh, uh, I mean, "Let me go read it because I don't want to miss don't want to miss take a shot at it." Uh, he says, uh, <clears throat> "Well." Watch me not be able to do that now. He, he makes the comment. I said it's in five. It may not be in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans, but he makes the comment. He says, y'all bear with me if you're out there listening. Chapter three. In the third chapter then, after he's made these statements here, he, he then comes back and says then this comment. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? And he, then he answers his own question. This is, this is that discussion I'm talking about. Paul asks a question, answers his question. Raises, a, raises an accusation, answers his accusation. In the third chapter of Romans, he says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much in every way. Chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. And for what, uh, for what if some did not believe and so forth. He says, you know what? It was important. Even though he, you say you can get through the end of this second chapter and say, well, okay, if God writes their laws in their hearts and their minds, then what advantage did the Jews have? He said it was much in every way. Why? Because God gave them his word. They were the only nation on the face of the earth that had the laws of God written down and given to them. They had the true worship service of God. The Egyptians didn't have it. The Babylonians didn't have it. The Chinese didn't have it. Wherever the, wherever the Norwegians were in those days, they didn't have it. None of these people had the written word of God and the oracles of God but the Jews. And he says that was a blessing to them. In every way. All right. So now we go back to the last part of the ninth chapter uh, and lead into ten. But Israel, which followed up, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, I would love to. Uh, I, well, I am. I'm just going to pause right here just to make this comment. The eleventh chapter of the book of Hebrews says this: Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Today, I think. Sometimes these little comments, you know, these little, these little uh, gems in the scriptures are, are overlooked by so many. If I asked any single person out there across most of the religious denominational world today and I would ask them and say, does, a con does getting down upon your knees and confessing Jesus Christ as your Savior and, and asking him to come into your heart, is that pleasing unto God? And they would say, yes. 
Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Which comes first, the confession or the faith that's written on their hearts? I'm going to tell you by the, by the word of the Apostle Paul written here in Scripture that faith written into your hearts through the new birth comes first. That allows you then to make confession. That allows you then to offer prayer. That allows you then to say, uh, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved by you. Come into my heart. He's already come into your heart. But the reason you're able to plead for that is because he's already there. So he, he makes this comment. They sought it not by, wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone, at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in sign a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Whoa! What was their, st what was their stumbling stone? They were ashamed of Jesus Christ. They didn't, that, was, that was where they stumbled. They saw a man that came in. He was obviously a good man. Even many of the Jews and many of the Pharisees acknowledged, he's a, surely this man's a prophet. Many of them thought he was a blasphemer because he claimed to be the son of God. But many acknowledged and said, hey, surely this man, look at the works he does. Look at the healings he does. There's nobody been like this since, uh, since Elijah was here on this earth. Surely this man is sent from God. They recognized this. But they stumbled at the stumbling stone of Jesus being a poor fisherman from Nazareth. They weren't expecting that kind of king. They weren't expecting a poor, humble man who came and just taught them the word of God. They weren't expecting one that would be persecuted uh, by, the, by the people. They weren't expecting one that would actually go to the cross and be put to death. How could he be the savior of Israel if he, uh, if he had come? Uh, they were expecting one to come and take David's seat there in Jerusalem and be the king over the people again. How could this be the Messiah? They were ashamed of his death. They were ashamed of his life. And they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Now, now, now I've done all this. You're ready to go into chapter 10 now. So now that we get into chapter 10, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is... Israel's already been defined for us. Don't forget def the definitions. Uh, he's already defined uh, Israel as being uh, that they're not all Israel that are of Israel, uh, uh, but to whom pertaineth the adoption and the covenant. So he's praying for his people that are born again children of God. That's who he's praying for. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. The automatic question ought to be, and y'all have heard this if you've been around for more than a year or two probably, Saved from what? Paul had a desire for a couple of things. Here, one, we get into this a little further, we'll see. Paul's praying for them to be delivered from their ignorance. Uh, and it wasn't that they, you know, sometimes we today, today I can laugh at this and y'all can laugh with me maybe. Uh, you know, some of we say they're ignorance. We think, well, these were stupid people. No, these were not dumb and stupid people. Just because you're ignorant of something doesn't mean you're dumb or, or somehow backward or whatever. But they were ignorant of what God had actually accomplished, what Jesus actually accomplished on the cross. And so, one, he's praying that they might be saved. But I think here in this first verse of 10, take, take, away, the, take away the chapters. Take away the verses. And what is it Paul's praying for them to be saved from? Their shame. They were ashamed of the Savior. They were ashamed of the stumbling stone. And brethren, he says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They never had quite logged it in that this one that came and died upon the cross uh, was their Savior. And so they were seeking it still. These Jews, even here at Rome, were seeking it by the law. Let me, just do, let me just go through and follow the law. And let me just hear the word of the law taught. They were not seeing the fact uh, that uh, these Gentiles, who were also in the church with them, had come to, the, had come to a belief in Jesus Christ and had come to a belief in the word of God but they'd come to it, to it by a totally different path. It was a path written in their hearts and their minds, the word of faith written within. For he says, for I bear them record, who? These, uh, these people of Israel. Uh, he says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. 
Who is God? What is God's righteousness? Jesus Christ. They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. The only true righteousness that matters for you and me, and I'm not going to say here today that as we do good works, that those things are righteous and, and just in God's sight. But I'll tell you what, you can do all the good works you want here today. You can go out and serve all the people you want to serve, and that will not make you just before the courts of heaven when Jesus Christ looks down and the Father looks down upon you. The only thing that's going to count is the righteousness of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the imputed righteousness of God for you. What Jesus actually died to give you is his righteousness, his life, his goodness. And so he says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. What? Because they, they can't see it. They've been raised up in this law and they think righteousness comes by doing the law. So they can't see that you can just trust the Lord and just follow after him with a simple heart and a simple mind and just follow after him and believe in him that your righteousness is through him. Uh, you know, that's that's the thing today in, in our churches uh, uh, across the land and country or here at, at Zion Rest, wherever you might be. When we get to thinking our righteousness comes by what we do versus looking to Him and worshiping Him and adoring Him, our worship services are to be about Jesus. He's to be the center of it. He's to be the focal point of it. Uh, I'm not going to say, and as I've studied about the Holy Spirit, the, the focal point is to be the righteousness we have through God, through Jesus Christ. And we need to be praying the Holy Spirit will come give us all the power we stand in need of to fight the battles that we have to fight. Okay, so he tells us here... Uh, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You no longer think you have to go off and check off all the check marks if you're attributing your righteousness to God and Jesus Christ alone. I'm telling you, it's such a glorifying doctrine uh, and a teaching uh, to, to realize we owe Him. Uh, you know, there's, there's songs we sing, uh, all to Him I owe. Uh, my, my friends, we owe it all to Him. He's the reason, and that's the reason we should come more humbly. You know, you know when you, uh, and, and I think we kind of get into this as we get into this 10th chapter, uh, but you know, th thinking that part, and y'all will get this with maybe without me completing the sentence totally, but you know, thinking that part of your righteousness comes by what, to, uh, that's, uh, by what you do. You know, it can become a self-aggrandizing thing. You can become to think, well, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, look, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and I've done, so I'm actually a pretty good person. Uh, and I'm not saying you're a terrible person. I'm just saying we need to recognize when it comes to the salvation that we enjoy, to Him we owe it all. To Him we owe it all to Him. It's not by, not by our works. And so he says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses, we could go into a whole discussion if y'all want me to, but I'll, I'll pause on it right now as to why you believe, okay? But let me just go back and put it this way. Uh, turn to 1 John chapter 5, and we'll read over there. Uh, uh, whosoever, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, which happens first, the writing of the laws uh, in your heart, and then faith, or, uh, uh, and, and faith comes, comes to you that way, uh, or does it come through you accepting or confessing? The Bible says new birth happens first. New birth is the, is the spark point then for you beginning to believe and hear and have faith and follow after him. And so he says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. That, that, poor, that phraseology if, for me, you know, has been somewhat, I had to you know, stumble over it some myself over the years, you know. What, is it, what does he mean by that? He means that the righteousness which comes by the law, the man has to do it. It's got to be done. You've got to do it 
year after year after year. That's what, that's what the, the law was all about. And so he says, Moses described the righteousness which is the law. That the man that doeth these things shall live by, by them. You can't just say, I believe them. You've got to do them. Uh, and, and that's what to, uh, you and I today, we shouldn't just be saying we believe in God's Word. We need to be doing it too. And I'm not <clears throat> downplaying that at all. But he says, But the righteousness which of faith speaketh on this wise. Here's what faith which is written in your heart teaches you. And I'll tell you, this is an important lesson. I wish every child of God could get this. Okay? But he says, But the righteousness which, of, which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. You and I are not to be judging who God's children are. We can't know. And when we say we can judge and know, my friends, it's like we're saying the work of Jesus Christ on the cross wasn't sufficient. Uh, it's to actually bring him back up from the dead. Uh, it's to bring him down off his throne. It's to say he needs to do something else. Uh, there's a second work of grace that needs to... That's what some people say. Uh, there's a second work of grace that needs to be done in people's lives. Or something else must be done. There must be confession made. There must be prayer made. Something else needs to be done. He says, the righteousness which is of faith. Do you know what it says in your heart? It, first of all, it says, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace. You know what? If there's other sinners out here. If they're saved, you know how they're saved? They're saved by grace. They, they're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's not my job to go around, uh, my friends, and decide who's going, uh, who's ascended up and who's, and who's, uh, who's descended. Uh, it's not mine, your job, to decide. Now, the Bible's, well, now, can't we be fruit inspectors? Yes, we can be fruit inspectors. I can see what people are displayed in their lives. And I, you know what I can decide from that? Who I want to hang around with. I can inspect fruit and decide who I... But you know what I can't decide from that fruit? Whether, whether or not they've sent, they're ascended or descended. The righteousness which is of faith. You know what it, part of what it teaches us? It teaches us how poor we are. It teaches us how thankful we ought to be. That's what the righteousness of faith written in our heart teaches us. And so he says, uh, what, But the righteousness which of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up again from the dead. What, shall, what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. <laughs> What, what does the preaching of God's Word do? It confirms what's already written in your heart and in your mouth by the, by the work of the Holy Spirit in the new birth. That's what the preaching of God's Word does. Uh, it says, what saith, what saith it? The righteousness of faith. What does the righteousness of faith say? It says, the Word's nigh thee. If God's already placed it down inside your heart. And He says, uh, uh, it's nigh thee. It's in thy mouth and in thy heart. And, and it says then, what does this also say? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth uh, uh, the Lord Jesus, uh, thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Who's he talking to? He's talking to those that were ashamed of the stumbling stone. If you, if you recognize this morning by the righteousness of faith uh, that uh, God has written his word in your, and that it's the word is nigh you, you know what he calls on us to do? Publicly confess it. That's what we're to do. We're to publicly confess, not so that we get to go to heaven one of these days, we're to publicly confess so that we'll declare to the world, I'm not ashamed of my Savior. I'm not ashamed of what He did. I know He died on the cross. You think specifically about these Jews. That was very important in their day. But it's important for our day too to say, you know what? I know He died on the cross. But you know what else I know by faith? I know He's seated on the right hand of the throne of God, interceding for me. And I'm not ashamed to call Him my Lord. I'll come forward. I'll confess with my mouth. I'll confess with my tongue. I'll confess to my neighbor. I'll confess to the church. I'll confess to the Lord Himself. I know you saved me by your grace and that you came into my life and you changed me and you turned me around. I'll confess that. And you know what it'll do? 
I'll realize I'm not ashamed anymore. <laughs> I'm not ashamed. He was calling on these Jews. Be not ashamed. Uh, confess with your mouth. Do it publicly. Let everybody know. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, it doesn't make, it doesn't bring salvation. Confession with the mouth doesn't bring salvation. But you're confessing unto what's already been done. Uh, you know, I use this as an example, and I'm probably going to stop somewhere right along here because of the because of the time uh, this morning. Uh, but uh, I could go down here today. You know, and uh, and say, well, I understand. I saw in the paper there was a there was a murder down here, uh, on the on the certain side of town or wherever. You know, I just thought I'd come down here and confess to it. You know what? My confession doesn't mean a thing if there's not some facts to back up the confession. My friends, mind your confession when it's backed up by the fact that Jesus Christ died for us means something. But uh, otherwise, you know what? A confession doesn't change the world. The, the, making a confession doesn't make something true. A confession just testifies to what's already true. And so he tells us here, he says, uh, For the Scripture saith, uh, uh, Whosoever believeth on him, let's, let's go back above, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Y'all thought I was just kidding about the fact that, all, that this all goes back to Romans 9 where they were ashamed of the stumblings at, at, the, at the rock that, which God placed in Zion, uh, Jesus Christ. They were ashamed of that and stumbled at the stumbling stone. So he goes through all of this discussion about what faith does for us and what the law does for us and the fact that there were people there that were ignorant of God's righteousness and were trying to work out their own righteousness. And he brings them over here and tells them, you know how you know this? Because it's written in your heart. It's nigh to your mouth. And he says, what are you to do? You're confess. Because with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now listen to this. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is over all, is rich unto all that call upon him. Doesn't matter if you've had the law all your life, Jews. It doesn't matter, Gentiles, if you haven't had the law. It doesn't matter if you were raised in a home that didn't go to church. It doesn't matter if you were raised in a home that they were there in church every Sunday. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter your background, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, he says, for the same Lord is over all, is rich unto all that call upon him. Uh, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if that's talking about eternal salvation, then you've got to call on somebody that you have no, no feeling for in your heart, that you don't believe in or anything else. You've got to call out to him so that he'll enter in. But this is talking about, you know what? I've been ashamed of my Lord. I have been living in a way that's not, that's not pleasing unto him. What I need to do is call on the Lord and he'll save me. He'll deliver me from my shame, from my sin, from my guilt. And, and, and help me to walk anew in following after him. Well, we got more to go. There's more in this book of Romans. It's full of good stuff. Uh, and and I, help, I think it helps us understand. Paul is having to explain to them, you know the battle that we've described to hear, to hear to you this morning about uh, people thinking they can justify themselves and people you know, on the other hand saying, you know what, God's written his law. That is the struggle today that's still going 2,000 years later. People are still having the discussion. Which comes first, the preaching of the gospel uh, or, the, or the new birth? Uh, which one actually brings the message? Uh, which, actually, which one actually brings salvation? Is it the message that brings He's going to get into that right below this. Uh, how can they hear without the preacher? Uh, how can they preach except they be sent? He's getting into all this discussion that you and I and the churches today are still having. You know, it's, I, I, like to, I like to use this terminology. 
a lot of times when I when I talk about stuff like this, you know, really it's no different than people trying to trying to talk about creation, and people say. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, you know, it's kind of like that when you talk about uh, which came first, uh, you believing and confessing uh, and God then entering into your heart, or did God enter into your heart and then you confessed and believed? It's which came first, okay? That's the argument that people are still having today. And I'm going to tell you, the chicken came first because God didn't create the eggs, he created the animals. And I'm going to tell you, he placed his law in your hearts and your mind. And that's what enabled you to believe and confess that you love him because God worked a work in you. May God bless you uh, as we go out into a new week. Remember what all you owe to him and try your best to live a life that gives him glory, honor, and praise. And then, you know, and then pause along the way and say, Lord, forgive me. I failed again today, but I still love you and I know you still love me. May God bless you is our prayer.